Hi, good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN, and I'm so excited to welcome you to tonight's presentation with a conversation between Amir Questlove Thompson and Hanif Abdurraqib. Thanks for coming. FAN is a nonprofit organization that presents a high quality speaker series offered free to the public on a wide variety of topics, including human development, mental health, education, and social justice. Uh, we have over 150 videos of past events on our website and YouTube channel, so please be sure to explore. And now for introductions. Drummer, DJ, producer, director, culinary entrepreneur, and New York Times bestselling author Questlove is the heartbeat of Philadelphia's most influential hip hop group, The Roots. He is the musical director for The Tonight Show starring Jimmy Fallon, where The Roots also serve as the house band. Questlove executive produced the acclaimed documentary series, Hip Hop, The Songs That Shook America on AMC under his production company, 215 Entertainment. 215 recently announced a first look deal with Universal Television to develop scripted and non-scripted programming. Questlove made his directorial debut with the feature documentary, Summer of Soul, which premiered at the 2021 Sundance Film Festival. It won the Grand Jury Prize and Audience Award for Best US Documentary. Summer of Soul broke the record for the highest selling documentary to come out of Sundance. Questlove is also set to direct the upcoming feature documentary on Sly Stone. Additionally, Questlove co-produced the Grammy award-winning original Broadway cast recording of Hamilton. He also co-starred in Disney Pixar's Golden Globe winning, excuse me, Golden Globe winning animated feature Soul, which landed him an NAACP Image Award nomination for outstanding character voiceover performance. A multidimensional artist, Questlove has also released multiple New York Times bestselling books. And tonight we celebrate his forthcoming new book, Music is History, which will be released on October 19th. We're also now honored to welcome back Hanif Abdurraqib to the fan virtual stage. Hanif is a New York Times bestselling poet, essayist, and cultural critic from Columbus, Ohio. He was recently named a 2021 MacArthur Fellow by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and Hanif's latest book, A Little Devil in America, Notes and Praise of Black Performance, is a finalist for the 2021 National Book Award for Nonfiction. He was named guest curator at large at the Brooklyn Academy of Music beginning in January of 2021, and he is the host of the new Sonos podcast, not so new anymore actually, Object of Sound. Mr. Adirakib's poetry has been published in Muzzle, Vinyl, and other journals. His essays and criticism have been published in The New Yorker, Pitchfork, The New York Times, and Fader. He's the author of the poetry collections, The Crown Ain't Worth Much, and A Fortune for Your Disaster, and the essay collections, They Can't Kill Us Until They Kill Us, and Go Ahead in the Rain, Notes to a Tribe Called Quest. And now with no further ado, let's welcome Questlove and Hanifa Biraki. Thank you, Lonnie, and thanks everyone at FAN for having me back. This is like my third go round, so I feel like... Uh... It's always a great time and, and uh, you know, Quest Love, it's, it's good to chop it up with you again, brother. Dog, I, I, I wanted to tell you, um, recently my girlfriend just got me uh, the tribe book. Like we were like major, 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 major fans of, of that book. And I never got to tell you that, but I digress. Thank you, man. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. Thank you. I don't, it's tough because I don't know where to start. So I read this last week and then I read it again on, I took a flight and I don't know where to start, but my first question is maybe about restraint, right? Because um, <laughs> what to leave out? And what yeah, leave because you're covering, <laughs> you know, I think the, the, the natural question that one might ask is like, how did you pick the years kind of thing? But I'm not, you know, that, that makes itself clear to me as I read the book, but I'm mm -hmm. wondering how you stopped yourself, you know, because it, each, yeah. each chapter is full, but not, not as full as it could be. Right. Here's the, here's the deal. Um, usually, Usually the way that the way that the, the the modus operandi seems to be is if I start giving a if I start giving too much away on Instagram, you know, <laughs> I, I'm almost certain that's when like my my manager calls like, yo, dog, like say that for the book, man. You you're giving too like that's always the thing. Like, cause if allowed to rant and rant and do paragraphs on Instagram alone about music lessons, then usually that's when my publisher is like, all right, dog, it's, it's time to, to reel it in and let's, let's make this a book. Um, to be honest with you, uh, sort of the premise of this book 
more than the other ones was really just started. I guess, I guess you could say a therapeutic thing. Cause for starters, um, even though I knew there was going to be a sixth book, I think in my mind before March 15th of 2020, when like the world shut down, yeah, I more or less was thinking about whether or not I should write the book that was really expected of me, which is, you know, for some reason, it's like I thought I overshared about music in, in the first book. And even in the other books that weren't about music, like about creativity and about food, there's a lot of music in there. But I, I kind of feel like people just want me to just write like an encyclopedia of everything I know and every song. Like if I could just put song and playlist together and as a dictionary or an encyclopedia. And so, you know, I'll say maybe I started that process of gathering uh, information for this, but I didn't realize that March 2020 was coming. And once, once that period happened where like the world shut down, um, I just caught myself staying sane by like riding midnight. My girlfriend and I were like quarantined on a farm. Um, you know, it was, it was weird enough trying to readjust to DJing online. You know, like when when D Nice started doing it for the first week, my manager was like, "Yo, D Nice is D, like this is the new normal. Let's go, let's go." You know, I, I kind of wanted to just, you know, get in a fetal position and and cry to my mom because <laughs> you know the the world was coming to end. We were all like, "I need handy handy wipes." Like, forget, like I didn't want anything. Like I didn't know what was happening. There was no Tonight Show, no Root shows, no more DJ gigs, no more travel. I didn't see my I haven't seen my band in weeks. And so um, we finally quarantined on a farm. Uh, first, the first order was trying to figure out how we're going to finish the movie. Uh, secondly, it was about, okay, let me try this online DJ thing and seeing that does anything for me. And then just getting through the day and having my first whew, moment it was usually like around 11 p.m., where, you know, it's so quiet up there, you got to do something. So that's when you start journaling. So it just became like a nightly ritual where I would just write from like midnight until maybe two, three in the morning until the next day and then repeat. Um, and even then I didn't realize, like I've just, I just decided to make lists of certain things and see if I could I could bring an idea forth and I guess around like May the decision was we're just going to pick one song a year and pretty much uh go through the timeline because the way that I treat music is not necessarily like music I treat music like a like a snapshot of life or a Polaroid. Yeah. Like the only way I can remember stuff is based on what song was out that year. Oh, that's the year I got in a car accident. Yep. Oh, that's the year I got, you know, like that's how I remember music. So that's why the book format came out the way that it came out. There's this part in here that I love where you talk about uh, what hip hop has taught you about songs, uh, about how they can be broken apart and, and stretched out. And I mean, I, you know, I'm similar. Obviously, I've written a lot about sampling. And mm -hmm. I think as I get older, uh, I spend even more time, even though the most exciting ideas around sampling in a tactile way came when I was like a kid and had tape decks and I could do like pause tape shit, you know, like, right. uh, and I don't do that anymore, but I'm actually, a, you know, I recently dove, uh, dove back into the meters catalog, right? And so naturally, like listening to the meters today, it's like, man, I hear, you know, one song, like I hear everywhere, you know, one meter songs echoed throughout right countless songs um and so i'm actually you know i'm wondering if you if your approach to appreciating the art of the sample has uh changed since you've grown and are maybe not as um you know because especially since you dj since you had like you're in the crates right um you know it's weird i want to i want i i would actually like to lose i wouldn't mind losing some bandwidth in terms of 
when you, I think when you're when you're a, a producer, especially if you came up in age of the bomb squad, if you came up in the age between like 88 and 98, yeah. there's just a different way. There's, there's a hyper synthesized like way that you listen to music that isn't regular anymore. In other words, when I hear a song, my mind is like, are these two bars? No, these two bars. No, these two parts. So I can't listen to a song like concurrently without thinking about is this a, like even even a song that you wouldn't do. All right. Take a take Stevie Wonder's Sir Duke, where everyone's just listening to that song as a song. In my mind, I'm listening to is that an open kick? Is that an open snare? Is that an open hi hat? Is this part loopable? Is that part loopable? Is that mm -hmm. part loopable? Is that, and then plus I'm a DJ. So there's another thing going to work where, um, you know, where uh, uh, I hear songs in keys. So that's why I did the chapter on yeah. uh, E flat minor versus. Yeah. So even then, my first thought is, where would this song fall on my DJ set? All right, shake your body down to the ground. That's that's G minor. So then there's no bridge in there. So then I got to figure out another song in G minor that has a bridge in B flat. And then I'm listening to every bridge. Is this in B flat? Is this in B flat? Oh, this is in B flat. So it's almost like I I, I can't I can't undo I can't undo the the kind of um that that uh it's 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 what what's the machine called uh actually my fourth cover book is based on a i'm about to say a rufus uh it's it's the machine where like the ball is sort of uh you know like if you set up dominoes and whatnot and yeah. there's a traveling ball that does like yeah, the, machinery, that, yeah. the machinery in my head is analyzing every bit of the song to see what's usable to make another song and you know sometimes i think in my age now i i want to get back to where i just uh rube goldberg i'm sorry a rube goldberg, rube goldberg yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was like rubus is rubenstein i know i know there's something in there um however i would like to get back to a place where um the the primitive way that I I took in music where everything was like just a, a, a climax it it was like discovery I wish I could get back to that place because now when I just hear music it's about what can I hunt and gather right. and throw away and yeah I need I need bandwidth <laughs> to to do other I things. hear you and I think you know as someone who kind of came up listening on the tail end or maybe not tail end but it's born eighty three but was listening to hip hop at a very young age and remember listening to Bomb Squad cuts and feeling like there's something about that era of sampling where you could just pull anything from anywhere. You could pour like 17 samples into one song, right? Mm -hmm. And the Bomb Squad was kind of like um, fracturing and refracturing what some would consider noise and mm -hmm. just like running it through. So listening to Bomb Squad shit when I was younger felt like I was just in this echo chamber of, of violent but pleasurable noise. And I think there's this thing that happens to me now where part of me kind of craves the the what I loved as a teenager, the so-called shiny suit era, right? Where there was just like one identifiable sample. You know, it's like, oh, my money, my problems. I know that song. You know what I mean? I think about this when um So when did you because ahead, ahead. because because you're 10 years younger than me? Because you're 10 years younger than me, when this stuff is coming out in 96, 97, 98, were you accepting of it like I, I believe there's a space for a music lover between like 12 yeah 17 where you, you just accept everything yep and so for you was it like did you have resistance to it i have resistance to it but because of where i am now with music i now find myself saying ah oh, i think this is not that bad like i actually like it <laughs> And, that's, I mean, and I, that's the problem. That's the reason why I wrote the book, because it's yeah. almost like what I felt about music 20 years ago 
it, it's different now. So, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I grew up in my, in my house, there were the real heads, right? And so I couldn't bring some of that shit in the house. But in my headphones, you know, I was listening. I thought about this recently because because I think Fat Joe's uh, Don Cartagena um, either had some kind of wayward anniversary. I was thinking about it and I was thinking about that era where like Puff was on everyone, like Mike Geronimo songs, you know, Puff was on like on a Mike Geronimo track. Right. right. That kind of that kind of stuff. <laughs> or or Karras one. I, right. Karras, like, I, how I do we feel about stuff. stepping into the world? <laughs> yeah. I didn't hate that stuff at all, but I couldn't bring it in. The, you know, I couldn't bring it in the house without getting clowned, you know, because. That was also the era of like Black Moon and Boot Camp and of course the Roots and, right. you know, Soul Quarians. So that was what was playing in my house. And, and um, particularly, you know, my brother went to college with in Cincinnati with the great Jay Rawls. Uh, mm -hmm. They were frat brothers. And so my brother, you know, and that was the time Cincinnati was having like a hip hop moment, high tech and Reflection right. Eternal. And so that was what was in the house. But in my headphones, yeah, I was, I was on the I was on the like Puff Daddy and the family type stuff. OK, so you you you, you got trickle down information. So you're yeah. the youngest of your, see, yep. that's the best where your older cousins and your older siblings. Okay. I, I was trying to figure out, wait a minute. How do you, how do you have the same knowledge that I do? And you're, you're like, <laughs> you're 12 years younger than me. Then I was like, oh, I gotta be older cousins. It's, yeah. Know? Yeah. Elders, man. Speaking see, of my, my, ahead, my thing was also, I was in the same situation, but the one thing I kind of didn't make clear in this book um, cause I, you know, I, I, I don't, I know that people are, you know, oh, Questlove is the all knowing teacher, whatever. But I mean, to be honest with you, the, probably the most important element of my musical education was I grew up in a don't touch my stereo household. So the first 12 years of my life, like this, I'm, I'm listening to the stuff against my will. Mm-hmm. I wasn't allowed to touch the turntable or none of that stuff. So I had to listen to that music. And only when sampling came in, then like those old jazz records started to be cool to me. But yeah, from ages zero to 13, I didn't like any of that stuff or just yeah. dismiss it. So. I love the, uh, I mean, I loved all of the, the sections that had kind of like little playlists. Um, and the, the first one I want to touch on was the hip hop deep cuts, especially because um, sometimes when you talk about deep cuts, you know, uh, left to left to the devices of the internet, people are like, "Oh yeah, this deep cut." They'll name like a you know something that was like literally a single. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Um, and I love these because they're really, really deep cuts. Particularly Murdergram, which you kicked off with, because um, I was someone who, in my like uh, youthful revisits of it, did not like Walking with the Panther. You know, like I actually didn't like LL, and I was like a kid, kid. <laughs> I was like, to be clear, I was like a kid, kid, kid when LL came out. So I listened. I listened back when I was a teenager and I was like, oh, mama said, knock you out. It's like the starting point for me. But now as I've gotten older and I listen to LL's back catalog, maybe this is something to do with his later career, but I, I love, I've, I've refound a love for walking with the Panther. And I didn't even like that when I was a kid, you know, like I didn't like it. See, but, this, is the, this, this is the thing that walking with the Panther is a perfect example of what I mean with this book and Polaroids and memories. Cause the thing is, is that, Technically, technically, Walking with a Panther had equal misses as it did Surefire Hits. And to be honest with you, it was like, it was neck and neck, but only because of me, Walking with a Panther comes out the week I graduated high school. And so like to have a feeling of like not having to get up at 6 a.m., you know, and beat the school bell. Like the feeling of freedom I had those three weeks after I graduated, you know, of course, then, you know, every black father's like, well, you gotta get a job or do, you know, that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. But just the world, the world was all right. And everything that happened in June of 89, July of 89. So, you're talking about Paul's Boutique. You're talking about Walking with the Panther. I mean, even like stuff like We Papa Girls and Cookie Crew. Like I was, anything that came out during those two months, I just absorbed. I think more or less I was just, I, I, I was having fun and good times during those three weeks I graduated high school and Walking with the Panther just happened to be there. 
because even now, like I make, I make, I probably make fun of songs on Walking with the Panther more than I champion it. Like, you know, One Shot at Love and and You're My Heart. And <laughs> I'm sorry, LL. I love it. Look, I I paid for this, but I got LL into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I'm I'm on the committee. <laughs> so I did my due diligence. I, I can at least clown a little bit, but I have more sentimental memories of the time period that that album came out more than I like that album, but I love that album, but I don't like, am I making I know sense? what you mean, I know what you mean. And I know we're confusing every bit, every last person watching right now. I'm trying to stay out of inside baseball, but yeah. That's real, I know, I mean, there's, and we don't have to go down too far down the road, but it is true that there are albums you love, but don't like, and, and what I actually love about your book is that it is kind of an archival of moment and how affections are so immensely tied to a moment, like I, if you were to ask me an album I love but don't like, it's the second Crisscross album. Love that second Crisscross album. The bomb. Don't like it much. I haven't listened to it in years, to be clear. You know what I mean? But, but it, you know, that was the album that came out in my, like, I think I was seventh or eighth grade. It was this, this moment, you yeah. know? And uh, I just remember, like, Live and Die for Hip Hop sampled Anita Baker. It was this whole thing. I was into it. But I don't like that album. Like, I wouldn't put that album in the top five, but I love it. See, it's, okay, you you and I should probably be best friends now because, you know, working, I had to work, I had to work that album. I interned at Rough House. So, oh, really? Yeah, Wait, really? So, you worked yeah, that album? I, I had to work that album, interning at Rough House. And so that was like one of the, that was like one of the last projects I worked on before the Roots got their record deal. Like I, I started when Totally Crossed Out came out and I ended right when the bomb and oh Fuji's literally my last act at, at Rough House was Chris Wartz wrote us a check for a thousand dollars so we can make a video to pass the popcorn and he made me guarantee that the Fuji's could open for us at our record signing party and so like yeah but I I too have fond memories of the bomb but yeah, not because I liked it, but just because I got a record deal. You know, that's yeah. so <laughs> it's kind there's, of fun. There's something that I, I think um, folks talk about archival, but you don't take archival lightly. And so I, I was interested about the, but not only the book is a physical object, um, because I think all your books are not only beautiful objects, but they're, they're useful in a way that books sometimes, you know, books aren't always beautiful and useful. Sometimes they're useful, but not beautiful. And sometimes they're neither. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I'm also like, uh, I'm someone who, uh, you know, I know you're a collector of a great many things as well. And I collect, I collect vintage magazines, um, Same. you know, starting from like the sixties and, and going up for me to the nineties. Cause that's when I was reading shit. That's when the source is coming to my house. That's when XXL is coming to my house. And um, I find myself missing the uh, kind of lack of immediacy you know, when I used, I used to get the source in Ohio, right? So it would come later than it would on the East Coast, naturally. Right. And so a lot of times I would have these formed opinions about albums before I saw the review. Like I remember, I'll never forget, and I, and I uh, you know, Elliot Wilson, you know, I love Elliot Wilson, but I'll never forget, he gave Camp Lowe's Uptown Saturday Night three mics. And I, I love that. Yeah, record. I remember that. I remember that. I, I love and like that record, to be clear. I love that record and I still like it a great deal. And I remember being like 12, 13 and being so mad. And I kind of miss that the physical, the physical form of archival. And, and you write really beautifully about magazines in here a bit. You write about the X, the infamous XXL cover. And I have a kind of dual prong question about um, just, you know, selfishly, I'm I'm interested in in this how that cover shoot went. Like that, that cover shoot is to me iconic. Uh, it's like my generation's maybe most famous cover shoot. But also I'm I'm just curious about um, you know, in this post-magazine era, because we're probably never going back. Uh, do you miss the physical objects and, and the usefulness of the physical objects? Dude, you just don't know. Like, imagine your fandom for these periodicals. But just imagine as a fan, you're allowed to dip your toe in the water to see what it's like to be an artist. And that's what I always felt like my participation was. I always felt like I was one of you, like, I felt like it was us and, you know, occasionally I'm allowed to take off my Clark Kent thing 
and become an artist to see what it looks like. And like the day, the day that the source fell apart, um, the day of the discovery of the, oh God, all right, this is an inside baseball moment. Uh, <laughs> so for everyone listening, <laughs> um, the reason why the Source Magazine was such a, a, a beloved uh, wealth of information, because I mean, really it was like the, one of the first periodicals to really have critical writing right about hip hop on a level of like Stanley Crouch era, uh, Village Voice or Rolling Stone, that sort of thing. And um, there was a sort of a conflict of interest in which uh, one of the heads of the magazine decided to uh, include a, a three page feature on one of the artists that they were managing. <laughs> Um, and it, it was kind of a thing, like it was agreed upon, like the staff would decide what would make the magazine. Credibility was at an all time high here and that trust was broken. And so mind you, when this issue comes out, uh, this is also the issue that has the lead review of my first out of, of my label debut, uh, Do You Want More? So I'm losing sleep every night. I'm asking my publicist, did it come out yet? Did it come out yet? How many mics did we get? How many mics did we get? Did we get the lead review? And when she, she called me at six in the morning, it's like, they're going to have a test pressing of the me, me. I, I, ran, <laughs> I literally ran out of 5212 Osage Avenue and went to 30th Street Station, got a, a one-way train ticket to New York City, sat on the train for an hour and a half, went down to like Soho, went outside that building and all hell was breaking loose because the staff had just discovered that this, th this, this three page article was yeah. stuck. Yeah. And the source literally, did, they all quit. And that was like the last day. So just to be there for that. But as far as you're talking about the double XL uh, recreation of a, a great day in hip hop, um, recreation of the Great Day in Jazz uh, cover. Great Day in for, Harlem. Great day oh, I'm Harlem. sorry, Great Day in, a Great Day in Harlem um, cover photo. Um, it, dude, September 28th, I mean, the fact that I still remember it, September 28th, 1998 was such a historical, one of the last historical days uh, I felt in, in classic hip hop memory. Um, like to wake up and the, your first thought is, wow, a new Outcast record is out, you know, Equimini. Uh, the Black Star album's out. Uh, Brand Nubian's Reunion album's out. Yeah. Jay Z's Heart Not Life album is out. And we didn't know it at the time, but the new Tribe Called Quest record is out. Like five records are out. And then on top of that, after, after spending so much time in, in limbo living in Europe, we, we exiled to Europe like in 93. I say exile, but creative exile. Like we moved to Europe um, in 93 and really wasn't like, we didn't play reindeer games. Like, you know, we still haven't met any Wu-Tang members or anything. So this was like the first time after, after making records um, that we're meeting like actual Wu-Tang members. We're, we're meeting like everyone. And when we got out the car, and Rakim sees Tariq and acts like we're meeting Rakim. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Rakim is very like deadpan or whatever. And he looked, he recognized me. And then he looked at, he said, yo, Thor, yo, man, I'm such a fan. And I could have cried on the spot, yo. I'm like, wait, Rakim, the God that we worship knows who we are. And literally it was, it was just like that all day. Like this, this is the day we've been waiting for. And then to top it off, we had just finished Things Fall Apart that morning. So right after that shoot, I went to go master and sequence the record. And I knew, and the feeling of excitement in the air, like I knew I had something. Like the only downer of the day was that night where I tried to go to that Jay-Z uh, release party and un- I'm sorry, that, that was another situation. Uh, the the Jay-Z un situation happened at Q-Tip's uh, record release party, but Jay-Z had a, a, 
a release for Hard Knock Life and like nobody could get it. And like, and I was like, wait a minute, is Jay Z that big? Like, I was still underestimating Jay Z. Like, I feel like a lot of people were around that time. I feel like that transitory period between like volume one and volume three was a lot of like, is Jay Z that big? Dude, we, we used to have discussions on like, yo, who do you think is going to take Biggie's place? Like, me and Q Tip would talk for like hours, like, well, now that Biggie's going, like, who do you think is going to be the new leader? And like, we're like trying to, none of us ever once thought Jay Z. And yet he just, he's like the first true manifester. Like, he spoke it and it happened. And, you know, I didn't realize the power of manifesting and how, like, I'm just learning that now. Yeah. I'm learning that, you know, because I meditate now and all those things, but I had to learn about the power of manifesting in the pandemic. But Jay Z was doing this since '98, saying things, and then it happened. Like, so yes, September 28th was was a monumental day. Not to mention, you know, to get to get your 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 photo done. Um, to, to watch. Uh, mm. God, I'm having a brain fart right now. Who took our photo? Um, it wasn't Gordon Parks, was it? <laughs> oh my God, I'm like, I'm talking about Gordon Parks. Yes, to, to, to watch Gordon Parks uh, take this photo, like I, I was in awe that he was taking the photo because Sheena Lester was just like losing her mind. Like, yeah. I'm here, Gordon Parks is gonna... And when he pulls out his camera, it was like the old timey, like it was, it was from the forties. Like it was one of those watch the birdie like he had to put the thing over his thing and and everyone stay still. Don't move after five seconds, like because the shutter's open. Yeah. It it was it was so magical, man. I'm I'm sorry for giving these long gargantuan answers, but no, know. this is so I have two things. I want I want to talk about I'm glad you brought up Rakim because I do want to talk about hip hop as a form that is aging. But first, because because I mentioned Camp Love and I was like, I'm not gonna ask him about any individual albums that I care about selfishly. But people are always on my ass about Uptown Saturday Night. Critics, hip hop folks, I was talking, I won't name the artist, but I did, a, I did an interview with a, uh, a hip hop artist I talked to a bunch of times. I was like, yeah, man, Camp Love's Uptown Saturday Night's in my top 10. It's like, I oh, get the fuck out of here, you know? So really, do you, do you feel like Uptown Saturday Night is a viable, top 10 top 25 all time thing i believe it is i believe it's extremely extremely underrated and never on list if you were to ask me in what 96 97 97 yeah if you were to ask me uh what my albums of, of 97 then i i would actually say that camp lowe's album would have been in my top five um but it's one of those things that you just take for granted because like we, I remember like, God, we played the mess out. Like Sparkle was on like, even now, if you, if you ask me, if you were to ask me like, what is your memory? What's your memory of recording? Like um, the, the, the period after, like when we finished Illadelph Half-Life, we started Things Fall Apart in 97. So like, you know, just that whole period at the very beginning of the Soul Quarians thing, like all that stuff, like the 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 B side, the Hollywood joint, um, the the Say Word joint, the Negro League, like all those things. Nick, like it's so weird that you take it for granted. Yeah. And, but it's never mentioned. It, it's it's almost like Black Thought, like someone so good that you just don't that you never, and I don't know why that is. I don't know why that is. I know it would probably rank higher, but when I think of 1997, nothing will, nothing, I thought I'd never feel about another product the way I felt about Public Enemy when I first heard it that summer. Yeah. And when Dilla is playing you music fresh off the, pre like to go in his car and listen to like, his creations to watch him make things like once I met Dilla then just my memory my memory any, anything else goes out and that's why I think maybe I don't champion camp low as high as I should because after you meet Dilla in 1997 nothing else matters in this world that's so uh, Elzai said that before too Elzai said this thing about like 
before Dilla, after Dilla. And I, that's, that's real. I, but you yeah. brought up thought and you brought up Rakim. And, and I've been thinking about hip hop as an aging form because so many people throughout my life, and I've been one of those people talk about hip hop as a young genre, which it is. But, you know, I, I blurred Rakim's book and talked to him uh, a couple times. And one of the things I just asked him, because, you know, he's like, he was like, well, who's your favorite MC? And I was like, shit, man, like you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like literally you. And yeah. I was like, you know, who's your favorite MC? And the, one of the first people he said was Black Thought, right? I was like, I mean, me, obviously me too, right? And so we're dealing with these generational, these generational moments where it's like, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up listening to Rakim and I spent, I spent the like second half of my teenage years falling in love with Black Thought. And it's wild that Rakim's favorite MC is Black Thought. Mm -hmm. And I am also very conscious of the fact that hip hop has lost a lot of folks recently. Like, mm -hmm. you know, enough, enough for me, me as someone who understands that life is cyclical and we're not promised anything, but it's happened at a rate that I've began to kind of assess um, the, the sustainability of the genre's history when folks aren't here. Like I cannot explain the first time I saw DMX to someone, right? That's a situation. The first time I saw the Get At Me Dog video, if you weren't in the room, like I can't explain that video to someone. And right. so I do worry about what gets lost um, with the very real passage of time, the tactile passage of time. This is why I am super obsessed with archiving things. Um, so just on the off chance that one of these things or one of these posts or one of these books or one of these interviews, uh, will stick around longer than I will. So, you know, maybe someone has an inkling of an idea of what, what happened or what went down, uh, come, you know, 20 2037 well i hope to live past 2037 I, I'd be like <laughs> 60 something but you know like 2070 or 2080 like that sort of thing um you know all the time i am concerned especially here's the deal if clearly clearly right now is the first time that we're learning that the truth might be optional and not to mention, you know, we get to see who gets to write history and who doesn't get to write history. Um, so I kind of like to think, I would like to think that what I'm doing is my version of, of graffiti, of defacing, of defacing property by leaving tidbits and information and, and documents and things um, that can't easily be erasable. So that at least someone has a, uh, an inkling of a or, or a clue as to what happened or what went on, and that's the thing. It's it's like, you know, all the time I hear, guy, and th that's the thing. Like a lot of my idols from that period, like they're they're in a very dangerous, kind of grumpy place right now, mm -hmm. uh, on social media, where I have to sometimes unfollow a lot of them, um, and. Their, their attitudes towards like the younger generation and whatnot uh, because they don't know a certain song and like, what do you mean you don't know what impeach the president is? Or what do you mean you don't know what the low in theory is? And my thing is like, dog, that's what you have to, you have to explain that to them. You can never take that for granted. The, the, the second year that I taught at NYU, um, we decided to teach about Thriller and the circumstances and the events that happened around late 82 all the way to 84. And of course, my first question is, um, how many of you are familiar with, with this record? And I have 24 students, only seven, only seven confirmed that they owned or listened to Thriller at least once. But most of them was like, yeah, my grandmama has that record. My grandfather mm -hmm. has that record. And these aren't like dumb, these are like, my, my students were like Maggie Rogers and uh, Take a Day Trip. The, yeah, the dude yeah, yeah, yeah. On Nas X and, and like at least seven or eight of my students who are super established right now. Um, but that's, I, I realized that, yeah, not even Michael Jackson's, uh, you know, Tour de Force, can, that can even be lost in, in translation if we're not careful. So 
Um, yeah, I, I think that I know that that history isn't easily transferable or easily passed down. So that's why I'm overly obsessed with providing information. And the role of elders. I mean, you mentioned it earlier when I was talking about like the shit I grew up on, but it is kind of, um, you know, it dawns on me now that that jokes and all that are one thing, but no one ever made me feel like the shit I was into was stupid when I was a kid, right? The stuff I was listening to, <laughs> no one ever clowned. If they clowned me for it, it was tenderly, right? It was tenderly, or it was like, if you like that, let me put you on to this, that kind of thing. Whereas like, okay. if you like, if you like, um, you know, like if you like Fat Joe, who, who like in the, you know, Jealous Ones, Envy, Don Cartagena era, like, let me put you on to this too. Um, you know, I found, um, I, I think I found music that way. And I don't know if that urge or hunger for discovery or connecting, like making musical maps um, is the same. But I think part of it's not the same because so many older heads, so many older folks are like cutting people off at the knees kind of when it comes to the, the like, you know, but it actually yeah. isn't surprising that it's not that surprising that, uh, 21 year old wouldn't have a connection to Thriller, right? It would require yeah. an exceptional interruption of a natural timeline for that to, for that to happen. You're right. Um, you know what, my dad was kind of one of those people when, um, when Quincy Jones was promoting uh, his autobiography, Listen Up, or his documentary, Listen Up about his life, um, and watching him on like BT and Video Soul and you know, it just seems so nurturing and so accepting of hip hop. And I'd never seen an old person like care who a Big Daddy Kane was or say the words Big Daddy Kane convincingly in a way that wasn't like, turn that big, you better Big Daddy Kane that homework, boy. Like that's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's every black household. You better public enemy that, that, that uh, science paper, you know, but you know, I, I, there was one point when I was just like, damn, man, like, why can't my dad be like Quincy Jones? Like, and that's the thing, like, my dad was, he, he was such a, and I talk about this a lot, like, he was, he was very specific on him falling out of music, like, my dad didn't like paying, he, he hated, I remember the day he brought, like, James Brown's The Payback album, and was mad that, you know, it was only, uh, uh, eight, uh, I'm sorry, t uh, two songs each side. Um, yeah. Like eight songs and, you know, I'm paying uh, $13.99 for this. It's like back in 73, which was like a lot of money for him. Um, he hated Stevie Wonder's Journey Through the Sneaker, Life of Plants. Like he thought music was dead after that album came out and stopped buying records. And this is a guy that brought 3,000 records. And like, if I were him, I, you know, I, I wouldn't stop buying records because I knew my son was absorbing this stuff, but he was just like, no, music's ripped off now. Like Stevie Wonder's doing these like dumb instrumental records. I'm done. And he was just so bitter about music and all the time, like I listen to, listen to America's Most Wanted, you know, Ice Cube and Fear of a Black Planet. And he's just like, you, you call that music? And I mean, the day that Rebel Without a Pause came out, he was like, is that some tea kettle you're listening to? Like, he just hated, and I didn't want to be that. So part of my nurturing thing, but the thing is, is like, I get tested as well. Yeah. Because even today, um, and it gets testy. And the thing is, is like, as a DJ, I have to play and embrace music that otherwise I wouldn't go for. And I don't want to be that guy that's like, Ah oh, man, this is generational. Like I shouldn't be listening to Megan Thee Stallion and that's not my music or whatever, but I don't know. Like, I feel like it's important to, to be open and to, to not leave anything out. You know, I, I don't want to be closed minded. And there's some days I do want to give up and just be like, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm tired of music, but you know, sometimes you have to go away and, and come back to it. I'll, I'll put it this way. Not making a record in eight years mm -hmm. has probably done us. Like, this album is so good, man. Like, I, I can't wait for the world to hear, like, what we've been up to in the last eight years. But 
sometimes you have to walk away from something to come back to it, you know? Yeah. One, I wasn't, I intentionally was not going to ask about the album because uh, not only was I told to stick to the book, but I was eager to stick to the book. But trust me, you know, if you ever want to, no. <laughs> <laughs> if y'all ever want an early listener, you know, y'all send me that album. I'd love to, I'd love to listen. Um, it's funny that you brought up, I, I sometimes teach a, I, I teach like a class uh, on, on sampling. And mm-hmm. when, when WAP came out, cause you brought up Megan, when WAP came out, obviously I was like, you know, there was a moral panic around the song from all the all the fellas and whatnot. But I was like, man, I wish some people. All were the older up. fellas, all the older fellas that made songs like "It Ain't No Fun." Right, right. I'm like, <laughs> How are you gonna be the guy that wrote like the ode to gang banging <laughs> <laughs> and not not that gang banging either? Yeah, <laughs> you're like, uh, uh, WAP. No, we can't, we can't do that. With all love to the legend, we can't have Uncle Luke stressed out about WAP. <laughs> you're like, come on. Man. Yeah, exactly. But that sample, right? Like that's a, when I heard that song, I was like, "Holy shit!" You know what I mean? Like the way they flip this kind of like Chicago house type thing. Um, right. And there's something about that that brings me that hope. That do you have hope that people, like I did when I was young, or like you did undoubtedly, hear something and then do that thing where they're cobbling and running back for the source material? Um, like, do you Dude, see that like, happening? I, as a DJ, that's the first thing. As soon as I heard uh, Frank Ski's the, uh, I believe Frank Ski's the originator of There's Some Hoes in This House. Yeah, yeah. And um, a, a, a house classic from, uh, I think, 1990. 90, and, yeah. um, you know, they flipped it for the WAP single for Megan Thee Stallion and, and, and uh, Cardi B. And, I mean, I was ecstatic because it was just, it's a small victory that will allow me to play the original. Yep and and teach people and that's the thing like when i dj i there's nothing there's nothing better than making people feel like they're smart and i don't mean that in a condescending way but you know part of the thing in teaching is the whole self-discovery of oh and that's what that means you know which is why like i like to assist in it i assist in it and then you're like wait where did i hit Oh my God, I know the song. This is what Megan the Stallion used for for da, 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 da. And I see that happen all the time when I DJ. And people feel better about themselves. They feel smarter. Like I discovered something. It's much different than, and now I'm gonna go back to the original sample right here, y'all. And <laughs> like if you do it, you that's like your friend wanting to like give away the movie ending or like. You know, no one likes to know it all. And that's the thing. I'm trying to be less of a know it all and just more of a uh, someone that pushes you in the direction, lets you discover it on your own. Uh, my last thing, because I know Monty's going to jump on with the audience question is since we're talking about physical objects and archives and all this, um, mm-hmm. and maybe I asked you about this when you're on Object of Sound, but if someone asks you again, I mean, the, the, the absence of the liner note has been something that's distressed me as I've, as I've, uh, as I, and that is the only thing, I'm not one of those folks who's like, I feel old or this make me feel old. Perhaps the only thing that, that agonizes me uh, when it comes to the passage of time is that yeah. I kind of grew up, I grew up reading cassette liner notes, which was hard as shit. You know what I mean? Like you had yeah. to get a magnifying glass, um, but it was the rewards of the liner note, not just citation, but also to understand who crews were and to, to trace out yeah. lineage, right? And now there's kind of no, historical point for that when an album is released unless you know i still get records but unless you have a physical thing there's not a lot of ways to trace that online and i think there's something missing there in terms of just the expression of gratitude for you know what i what i love so much about and i'm not you know j cole's j cole but what i loved about the end of forest hills drive was uh that last track where it's like eight minutes of him just thanking people you know, like audibly. Mm-hmm. You know, audio you know, liner note, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like an audio liner note. And I, I wish that, I, I dream that. I wish that upon every album, but I think there's something along the lines of gratitude that's maybe missing when the liner note gets extracted. I, I was going to say that um, when I when I tried to, I, I, I vowed um, to at least try to listen to Donda once from beginning to end how'd that go <laughs> you know what without just something tangible and i'm sorry wikipedia is not enough like wikipedia is not enough for me to 
yeah and again like i i feel as though almost like that's the magic of core roots fans you know before social media my my liner notes were this was social media mm-hmm. um i really the, i mean the main reason why i got book offers was because it's sort of like fans being angry at the fact that i didn't have liner notes in like albums after game theory like once i realized that the tangible experience of having a cd or an album in your hand and plus the label was like look amir you can only get like six pages so you know gone are the days where we provide you with 24 pages for you to talk paragraphs and paragraphs about how this song got made and how that song got made which is what i would do for like from Illadelph Half-Life all the way up until the tipping point, I just keep a diary of how songs got created. Um, that I felt that that almost aided in our fan base and our record sales is the fact that we were showing you how the sausage was made. Um, it was it was it was taxing trying to get through Donda without any visual reference whatsoever because it's a black album cover. And it's an album over two hours long. Um, and to top it off, the day that I decided to commit to listen to it, like Michael K. Williams had just died. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was on like a 15 hour trip coming from uh, St. Louis back to New York. Um, so kind of mourning over Michael K. Williams and listening to Donda uh, would just, it, it almost ruined the experience for me. Um, and, you know, I, I hear of there is coming, uh, an app or some website that's going to have liner notes for every album, even albums that didn't have liner notes. Um, but yeah, I, I think I'm hoping that this embracing of like vinyl culture is, is a, a real thing because, I love nothing better than for liner notes. Like, and for Roots fans, like some of the best liner notes I've ever written in my life were for the the 25th anniversary of uh, our Do You Want More um, yeah. Yeah. album that just came out. The, you know, we I went through the whole entire record and redid liner notes and all those things. Um, and, you know, there's only like maybe 10,000 copies of that album pressed up, but yeah, man. I, so to me, liner notes, there was nothing like opening up songs in the key of life when you're six years old and going through everything. Like that was, was my gonna first reference song songs in the key of life is like some of my all time, all time best liner. Notes. I mean, truly. That like, was that was my my first day of school. That was our first homework assignment. Have your mom and dad purchase songs in the key of life. And we literally came to class the next day, all of us with our records. And we pulled out that liner note booklet and she taught us what like cellos were. This is cello and, you know, this, this is a triangle and this is like everything we were listening to on that record. This is, this is a harp and her name is Dorothy Ashby. And, you know, like we went through each cut, each side, each day we went through and used those liner notes. And that to me, oh, that to me, uh, just opened up the portals in my head about how to share information. Yeah, I miss liner notes, man. Questlove, brother, it's a pleasure a pleasure talking to you as always. I'm gonna get out the way and let Lonnie ask a couple audience questions, but it's always a pleasure, fam, and I appreciate the work. Thank honey, you. you are, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Honey, if you are never in the way, I feel I'm in the way. And I tried to I'm taking it all the way to 855 because I know people are just loving this conversation love just uh, the great rapport between the two of you. So I'm going to jump in and we're going to go with, uh, we'll go with the most, uh, a question that's gotten a lot of likes is from Ben. He says, 25 years down the road, Questlove, what do you think mainstream music looks like? Um, you know, I, 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 think, I think the world likes to think that it's, that it's linear, but <laughs> everything is circular. Uh, I think that we go in 20 year cycles. So uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised if there's an embracing of something that was hip. You know, there, it might be 40s jitterbug culture. It might be 
big band jazz era. It, you know, it's, it's really hard to tell. It might just be tonal noises. Like, I'm gonna tell you something weird. Um, I didn't realize, I forgot that on Spotify, you can see someone's algorithm, like you can see what they're listening to all the time. And um, a friend of mine was sort of like, hey, are you okay? Because, you know, all you're doing is listening to these like binaural beats. Like I, I listen to a bunch of white noise. Like there's 20 minutes of just like of, of a particular buzzing noise, but I use it just to calm me down and, and to meditate, but I play it 24 seven. So when you see what I listen to at the end of the year, it's a bunch of that stuff. And I don't know, it's, it's, it's weird that that's my go-to thing. Like it used to be hip hop and now I drive around listening to uh, 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 tones. And so <laughs> I wouldn't be at all shocked if like nature sounds and tones are like, if, if, that's, if, that's, the new, uh, if that's the new hype. <laughs> I love that answer. Uh, we have time for maybe one more. We got about three minutes here and I'm going to pick it. It's from Jeff. He says, was there a particular year outlined in your book where you saw a true cultural paradigm shift, one that crossed genres or brought different audiences together that caught you by surprise? I think I, I think I've mentioned that the, I think the one year in which all the stars were aligned, at least for my personal taste. I was trying to figure out, because sometimes like years, a good year for hip hop, like, okay, to a hip hop head, 1991 is like, ah, uh, that was like some of the, next to 88, 91 was like such a special year in hip hop. But uh, on the non hip hop uh, year uh, angle of things, like a lot of 80s artists struggled in 1991. So it wasn't so good of a year for them. So I'll actually say that 1987 was probably the closest year in which my hip hop and my soul uh, and my new Jack swing were all aligned with each other. <laughs> Prince made great music. I mean, Eric B and Rakim Boogie Down Productions were making awesome hip hop. Uh, you know, U2's Joshua Tree came out. So like for rock music, for soul music, for hip hop, that's one of the rare times where like, you know, all the stars were aligned. Okay, good. And uh, we're one minute. Jeff asks, different Jeff says, brother, do you ever sleep? This is my bedroom. I will be going. <laughs> I'm, current, I'm currently right now. Uh, I'm I'm secretly working on my second project, which is not the Sly and the Family Stone thing. Uh, the world will be aware of what I've been working on in the last two weeks uh, after Halloween. Um, I'm doing something majorly incredible right now that requires like 18 hour days. Um, <laughs> Well, thank it, it'll be very viral. It's a short clip, but it's 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 going to be a, a, an amazing thing. So that's sort of like between this book and uh, my next movie and also promoting Summer Soul and the Roots album and this short masterpiece thing that I'm doing. Um, yeah, it's a heavy week, but it's, you know, it's Mercury and Retrograde, but I'll be fine after... Uh, after uh, November 1st. Well, thank you so much for your time tonight. We're glad that you slotted in an hour for us. We really do appreciate it. Um, we're going to see Hanif in just a few more minutes and you, and you as well. Thank you everyone for attending. We hope you enjoyed this conversation and we hope to see it more fan programs in the future. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Questlove. Thank you so much. Thank you.